the contrite consciousness from phenomenology of the spirit by georg wilhelm hegel published in eighteen hundred and seven translated by josiah royce this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the contrite consciousness in skepticism consciousness learns in truth that it is divided against itself and from this experience there is born a new type of consciousness wherein are linked the two thoughts which skepticism had kept asunder the thoughtless self-ignorance of skepticism must pass away for in fact the two attitudes of skepticism express one consciousness this new type of consciousness is therefore explicitly aware of its own doubleness it regards itself on the one hand as the deliverer changeless and self-possessed on the other hand it regards itself as the absolutely confounded and contrary and it is the awareness of this its own contradiction in stoicism the self owns itself in the simplicity of freedom in skepticism it gives itself embodiment makes not of other embodied reality but in the very act of so doing renders itself the rather twofold and is now parted in twain hereby the same duplication that was formerly shared between two individuals the lord and the slave has now entered into the nature of one individual the differentiation of the self which is the essential law of the spirit is already present but not as constituting an organic unity and the contrite consciousness is this awareness of the self as the divided nature wherein is only conflict this contrite and broken consciousness just because the conflict of its nature is known as belonging to one person must forever in each of its two forms have the other also present to it whenever in either form it seems to have come to victory and unity it finds no rest there but is forthwith driven over to the other its true homecoming its true reconciliation with itself will however display to us the law of the spirit as he will appear when having come to life he has entered the world of his manifestation for it already belongs to the contrite consciousness to be one undivided soul in the midst of its doubleness it is in fact the very gazing of one self into another it is both these selves it has no nature save in so far as it unites the two but thus far it knows not yet this its own real essence it has not entered into possession of this unity for the first then the contrite consciousness is but the unone unity of the two selves to its view the two are not one but are at war together and accordingly it regards one of them viz the simple the changeless consciousness as the true self the other the multiform and fickle it regards as the false self the contrite consciousness finds these two as mutually estranged for its own part because it is the awareness of this contradiction it takes sides with the changeless consciousness and calls itself the false self but since it is aware of the changeless i e of the true self its task must be one of self-deliverance that is the task of delivering itself from the unreality for on the one hand it knows itself only as the fickle and the changeless is far remote from it and yet the contrite consciousness is in its genuine selfhood one with the simple and changeless consciousness for therein lies its own true self and yet again it knows that it is not in possession of this true self so long as the contrite consciousness assigns to the two selves this position they cannot remain indifferent to each other or in other words the contrite consciousness cannot itself be indifferent to the changeless
for the contrite consciousness is as a fact of both kinds and knows the relation of the changeless to the fickle as a relation of truth to falsehood the falsehood must be turned to naught but since the contrite consciousness finds both the false and the true alike necessary to it and contradictory there remains to it only the contradictory movement wherein neither of the opposed elements can find repose in going over to its opponent but must create itself anew in the opponent's very bosom to win then in this strife against the adversary is rather to be vanquished to attain one goal is rather to lose it in its opposite the whole life whatever it be whatever it do is aware only of the pain of this being and doing for this consciousness has no object besides its opposite the true self and its own nothingness in aspiration it strives hence toward the changeless but this aspiration is itself the contrite consciousness and contains forthwith the knowledge of the opposite namely of its own individuality the changeless when it enters consciousness is sicklied or with individuality is present therewith instead of being lost in the consciousness of the changeless individuality rises ever afresh therein but one thing the contrite consciousness thus learns namely that individuality is made manifest in the changeless and that the changeless is made manifest in individuality it finds that in general individuality belongs to the changeless true self and that in fact its own individuality also belongs thereto for the outcome of this process is precisely the unity of this twofold consciousness this unity then comes to light but for the first only as an unity wherein the diversity of the two aspects plays the chief part for the contrite consciousness there thus result three ways in which individuality and the changeless are linked first it rediscovers itself as again banished into its opposition to the changeless self and it is cast back to the beginning of the strife which later still remains the element of the entire relationship in the second place the contrite consciousness learns that individuality belongs to the very essence of the changeless is the incarnation of the changeless and the latter hereupon assumes the burden of its whole range of phenomena in the third place the contrite consciousness discovers itself to be the individual who dwells in the changeless in the first stage the changeless appears to consciousness only as the remote self that condemns individuality in passing through the second stage consciousness learns that the changeless is as much an incarnate individual as it is itself and thus in the third stage consciousness reaches the grade of the spirit rejoices to find itself in the spirit and becomes aware that its individuality is reconciled with the universal what is here set forth as the character and relationship of the changeless has appeared as the experience that the divided consciousness obtains in its woe this experience is to be sure not its own one-sided process for it is itself the changeless consciousness and the latter is also an individual consciousness so that the process is all the while a process in the changeless consciousness belonging to the latter quite as much as to the other for the changeless consciousness passes through the three stages being first the changeless as in general opposed to the individual then becoming an individual over against another individual and finally being united with the latter but this observation in so far as it is made from our own point of view as observers is here premature for thus far we have come to know the changeless only in so far as consciousness has defined it not as yet the true changeless 
but the changeless as modified by the duality of consciousness has come to our sight and so we know not how the developed and self-possessed changeless will behave what has resulted from the foregoing is only this that the mentioned characteristics appear to the consciousness now under consideration as belonging to the changeless consequently the changeless consciousness itself also preserves even in its incarnate form the character and principle of separation and isolation as against the individual consciousness from the latter's point of view the fact that the changeless takes on the form of individuality appears as something which somehow comes to pass the opposition to the changeless is something moreover which the individual consciously merely finds as a fact the relation seems to it merely a result of its natural constitution as for the final reconciliation the individual consciousness looks upon this as a part of its own deed the result of its own individuality but it also regards a part of the unity as due both in origin and in existence to the changeless the element of opposition thus remains even in the unity in fact in taking on the incarnate form the changeless has not only retained but actually confirmed its character of remoteness for although in assuming a developed and incarnate individuality it seems on the one hand to have approached the individual still on the other hand it now stands over against him as an opaque fact of sense with all the stubbornness of the actual about it the hope that the individual may become one with the changeless must remain but hope empty and distant for between hope and fruition stand now the fatal chance and the lifeless indifference which has resulted from that very incarnation wherein lies the foundation of the hope because the changeless has thus entered the world of facts has taken on the garments of actuality it follows necessarily that in the world of time it has vanished that in space it is far away and forever far remains if at the outset the mere notion of the divided consciousness demanded that it should undertake the destruction of its individuality and the growth into the changeless the present result defines the undertaking thus that the individual should leave off its relation with the formless ideal and should come only into relation with the changeless as incarnate for it is now the fact of the unity of the individual and the changeless which has become the truth and the object for consciousness as before in the mere notion only the abstract and disembodied changeless was the essential object and consciousness now finds the total separation of the notion as the relation which is to be forgotten the thing which has now to be reduced to unity is the still external relation to the embodied ideal in so far as the latter is a foreign actuality the process whereby the unreal self seeks to reach this unity is once more threefold since it will be found to have a threefold relation to its incarnate but remote ideal in the first place it will appear as the devout consciousness in the second place as an individual whose relation to the actuality will be one of aspiration and of service in the third place it will reach the consciousness of self-possession we must now follow these three stages of being and see how they are involved in the general relation and are determined thereby taking the first state that of the devout consciousness one finds indeed that the incarnate changeless as it appears to this consciousness seems to be present in all the completeness of its being but as a fact the fashion of the completed being of the changeless has not yet been developed should this completed being be revealed to consciousness the revelation would be as it were rather the deed of the ideal than the work of the devout consciousness 
and thus the revelation would come from one side only would be no full and genuine revelation but would remain burdened with incompleteness and with duality although the contrite consciousness still lacks the presence of its ideal it is nevertheless as we see also beyond the stage of pure thought whether such thought were the mere abstract thinking of stoicism which forgets all individuality or the merely restless thinking of scepticism which in fact embodies individuality in its ignorant contradictions and its ceaseless unrepose both of these stages the contrite consciousness has transcended it begins the synthesis of pure thought and of individuality and persists therein but it has not yet risen to the thought which is aware of the reconciliation of the conscious individual with the demands of pure thought contrite consciousness stands between the two extremes at the place where pure thought and the individual consciousness meet it is in fact itself this meeting place it is the unity of pure thought and individuality it even knows that pure thought yes the changeless itself is essentially individual but what it does not know is that this its object the changeless which it regards as having necessarily assumed an incarnate individuality is identical with its own self with the very individual as he is in consciousness its attitude then in this first form in which it appears as the devout consciousness is not one in which it explicitly thinks about its object it is implicitly indeed the consciousness of a thinking individual and its object also is a thinking individual but the relation between these two is still one that defies pure thought consciousness accordingly as it were makes but a feint at thinking and takes the form of adoration such thought as it has remains the mere formless tinkling of an altar bell or the wreathing of warm incense smoke a thinking in music such as never reaches an organized notion wherein alone an inner objectivity could be attained this limitless and devout inner feeling finds indeed its object but as something uncomprehended and so as a stranger thus come to pass the inward activity of the devout soul which is indeed self-conscious but only in so far as it possesses the mere feeling of its sorrowful disharmony this activity is one of ceaseless longing it possesses the assurance that its true self is just such a pure soul pure thought in fact taking on the form of individuality and that this being who is the object of the devotion since he possesses the thought of his own individuality recognizes and approves the worshipper but at the same time this being is the unapproachable and remote as you seize hold upon him he escapes or rather he has already gone away he has already gone away for he is the ideal giving himself in thought the form of an individual and therefore consciousness gets without hindrance its self-fulfillment in him gets self-fulfillment but only to learn that it is the opposite of his ideal instead of seizing hold on the true self its mere feeling is all it sinks back into itself unable at the moment of union to escape finding itself at the very opposite of the ideal it has actually seized hold upon its own untruthfulness not upon truth in the true self it has sought to find its own fulfillment but its own means only is isolated individual reality for the same reason it cannot get hold upon the true self in so far as he is at once an individual and a reality where one seeks him the true self is not to be found for by definition he is the remote self and so is to be found nowhere to seek him in so far as he is an individual is not to look for his universal his ideal individuality 
nor for his presence as the law of life but merely to seek him as an individual fact as a fact among facts as something that sense could touch unhindered but as such an object the ideal exists only as a lost object what consciousness finds is thus only the sepulchre of its true life but this sepulchre is now the actuality and moreover one that by its nature forbids any abiding possession the presence of this tomb means only the strife of a search that must be fruitless but consciousness thus learns there is no real sepulchre which can contain its true lord the changeless as lord who has been taken away he is not the true lord the changeless will no longer be looked for here below or grasped after as the vanished one for hereby consciousness learns to look for individuality as a genuine and universal ideal in the next place then the return of the soul to itself is to be defined as its knowledge that in its own individuality it has genuine being it is the pure heart which potentially or from our point of view has discovered the secret of self-satisfaction for although in feeling it is sundered from its ideal still this feeling is in essence a feeling of self-possession what has been felt is the ideal as expressed in terms of pure feeling and this ideal is its own very self it issues from the process then as the feeling of self-possession and so as an actual and independent being by this return to itself it has from our point of view passed to its second relationship that of aspiration and service and in this second stage consciousness confirms itself in the assurance of self-possession an assurance which we now see it to have attained by overcoming and feeding upon the true self which in so far as it was an independent thing was estranged from the point of view of the contrite consciousness however all that yet appears is the aspiration and the service it knows not yet that in finding these it has the assurance of self-possession as the basis of its existence and that its feeling of the true self is a self-possessed feeling not knowing this it has still ever within it the fragmentary assurance of itself therefore any confirmation which it should receive from toiling and from communion would still be a fragmentary confirmation yes itself it must destroy even this confirmation also finding therein indeed a confirmation of something but only of its isolation and its separation the actual world wherein the aspiration and the service find their calling seems to this consciousness no longer an essentially vain world that is only to be destroyed and consumed but rather like the consciousness itself a world broken in twain which is only in one aspect vain while in another aspect it is a sanctified world wherein the changeless is incarnate for the changeless has retained the nature of individuality and being as changeless and universal its individuality has in general the significance of all actuality if consciousness were now aware of its independent personality and if it regarded the actual world as essentially vain it would get the feeling of its independence in its service and in its communion since it would be aware of itself as the victory that overcometh the world but because the world is regarded by it as an embodiment of the idea it may not overcome by its own power it does indeed attain to conquest over the world and to a feasting thereon but to this end it is essential that the changeless should itself give its own body as the food and in this respect consciousness appears as a mere matter of fact having no part in the deed 
but it also appears as inwardly broken in twain and this doubleness its division into a self that stands in a genuine relation to itself and to reality and a self whose life is hidden and undeveloped is now apparent in the contrast between its service and its communion as in actual relation to the world consciousness is a doer of works and knows itself as such and this side belongs to the individuality but it has also its undeveloped reality this is hidden in the true self and consists in the talents and virtues of the individual they are a foreign gift the changeless grants them to consciousness that they may be used in doing its good works consciousness is for the first parted into a relationship between two extremes on the one side stands the toiler in the world here below on the other side stands the passive actuality in whose midst he toils both are related to each other both however are also referred to the changeless as their source and have their being hidden therein from each side then there is but a shadowy image let free to enter into play with the other that the term of the relationship which is called the actuality is overcome by the other term the doer of good works but the former term for its part can only be overcome because its own changeless nature overcomes it divides itself in twain and gives over the divided part to be the material for deeds the power that does the deeds appears as the might that overcometh the world but for this very reason the present consciousness which regards its true self as something foreign must regard this might also whereby it works as a thing remote from itself instead of winning self-possession from its good works and becoming thereby sure of itself consciousness relates all this activity back again to the other member of the relationship which thus proves itself to be the pure universal the absolute might whence flows every form of activity and wherein lies the truth both of the mutually dissolving terms as they first appeared and of their interchanging of relationship the changeless consciousness sacrifices its body and gives it over to be used on the other hand the individual consciousness renders thanks for the gift forbids itself the satisfaction of a sense of independence and refers all its doings to the changeless in these two aspects of the mutual sacrifice made by both the members of the relation consciousness does indeed win the sense of its own oneness with the changeless but at the same time this oneness is still beladen with the separation and is divided in itself the opposition between the individual and the universal comes afresh to sight for consciousness only seems to resign selfish satisfaction as in fact it gets selfish satisfaction for it still remains longing activity and fulfillment as consciousness it has longed it has acted it has been filled in giving thanks in acknowledging the other as the true self in making naught of itself it has still been doing its own deed this deed has repaid the deed of the other has rendered a price for the kindly sacrifice if the other has offered its own image as a gift consciousness for its part has made its return in thanks and has herein done actually more than the other since it has offered its all namely its good works while the other has but parted with its mere image the entire process returns then back to the side of the individual and does so not merely in respect to the actual aspiration service and communion but even in respect to the very act of giving thanks an act that was to attain the opposite result in giving thanks consciousness is aware of itself as this individual 
and refuses to be deceived by its own seeming resignation what has resulted is only the twofold reference of the process to its two terms and the result is the renewed division into the conflicting consciousness of the changeless on the one hand and on the other hand the consciousness of the opposed will activity and fulfillment and even of the very resignation itself for these constitute in general the separated individuality herein begins the third phase of the process of this consciousness which follows from the second as a consciousness that in truth by will and by deed has proved its independence in the first phase it was the mere notion of a live consciousness an inner life that had not yet attained actuality by service and communion the second phase was the attainment as outer activity and communion returned from this outer activity consciousness has now reached the stage where it has experienced its own actuality and power where it knows in truth that it is fully self-possessed but now the enemy comes to light in his most genuine form in the struggle of the inner life the individual has existence only as an abstraction as passed in music out of sight in service and in communion as the realization of this unreal selfhood it is able in its immediate experience to forget itself and its consciousness of its own merit in this actual service is turned to humiliation through the act of thankful acknowledgment but this humiliation is in truth a return of consciousness to itself and to itself as the possessor of its own actuality this third relationship wherein this genuine actuality is to be one term is that relationship of the actuality to the universal wherein the actuality is nevertheless to appear as an unreality and the process of this relationship is still to be considered in the first place as regards the conflicting relationship of consciousness wherein its own reality appears to it as an obvious nothingness the result is that its actual work seems to it a doing of naught and its satisfaction is but a sense of its misery work and satisfaction thus lose all universal content and meaning for if they had any then they would involve a full self-possession both of them sink to the level of individuality and consciousness turning upon this individuality devotes itself to making naught of it consciousness as an actual individual is a consciousness of the mere animal functions of the body these latter are no longer naively carried out as something that is altogether of no moment and that can have no weight or significance for the spirit on the contrary they become the object of earnest concern and are of the most weightiest moment the enemy arises anew in his defeat consciousness holds him in eye yet frees itself not from him but rather dwells upon the sight and sees constantly its own uncleanness and because at the same time this object of its striving instead of being significant is of the most contemptible instead of being an universal is of the most individual we therefore behold at this stage only a brooding unhappy and miserable personality limited solely to himself and his little deeds but all the while this person links both to the sense of his misery and to the worthlessness of his deeds the consciousness that he is one with the ideal for the attempted direct destruction of individuality is determined by the thought of the ideal and takes place for the sake of the ideal this relation of dependence constitutes the essence of the negative onslaught upon individuality but the dependence is as such potentially positive and will bring consciousness to a sense of its own unity 
this determinate dependence is the rational tie whereby the individual who at first holds fast by his opposition to the true self is still linked to the other term yet only by means of a third element this mediating element reveals the true self to the false self which in its turn knows that in the eyes of the true self it has existence only by virtue of the dependence it is the dependence then which reveals the two terms of the relationship to one another and which as mediator takes the part of each one of the terms in presence of the other the mediator too is a conscious being for its work is the production of this consciousness as such what it brings to pass is that overcoming of individuality which consciousness is undertaking through the mediator then consciousness frees itself from regarding its good works and its communion as due to its private merit it rejects all claims to independence of will it casts upon the mediator the intercessor the burden of its self-will its freedom of choice and its sins the mediator dwelling in the immediate presence of the ideal gives counsel as to what is to be done and what is done being in submission to the will of another is no longer one's own act what is still left to the untrue self is the objective result of the deed the fruit of the toil the satisfaction but this too it refuses to accept as its own and resigns not only its self-will but the actual outcome of its service and its satisfaction it resigns this outcome first because the latter would involve an attainment of self-conscious truth and independence and this consciousness lives in the thought and the speech of a strange and incomprehensible mystery secondly moreover it resigns the outcome in so far as the latter consists of worldly goods and so it abandons in a measure whatever it has earned by its labor thirdly it resigns all the satisfaction which has fallen to its lot forbidding itself such satisfaction through fasting and through penance by these characteristics by the surrender of self-will of property and of satisfaction and by the further and positive characteristic of its undertaking of a mysterious task consciousness does in truth free itself completely from any sense of inner or outer freedom from any trust in the reality of its independence it is sure that it has verily surrendered its ego and has reduced its natural self-consciousness to a mere thing to a fact among facts only by such a genuine self-surrender could consciousness prove its own resignation for only thus does there vanish the deceit that lies in the inner offering of thanks with the heart with the sentiments and with the lips such offering does indeed strip from the individual all independent might and ascribes all the glory to the heavenly giver but the individual even when thus stripped retains his outer self-will for he abandons not his possessions and he retains his inner self-will for he is aware that it is he who undertakes this self-sacrifice and who has in himself the virtue involved in such an undertaking a virtue which he has not exchanged for the mysterious grace that comes from above but in the genuine resignation when once it has come to pass consciousness in laying aside the burden of its own deeds has also in effect laid aside the burden of its grief yet that this laying aside has already in effect taken place is due to the deed of the other member of the tie namely to the essential self the sacrifice of the unreal self was made not by its own one-sided act but involved the working of the other's grace for the resignation of self-will is only in part negative and on the other hand involves in its very notion 
or in its beginning the positive transformation of the will and in particular its transformation from an individual into an universal will consciousness finds this positive meaning in the denial of self-will to consist in the will of the changeless as this will is done not by consciousness itself but through the counsel of the mediator consciousness becomes aware then that its will is universal and essential but it does not regard itself as identical with this essential nature self-resignation is not seen to be in its very notion identical with the positive work of the universal will in the same way the abandonment of possession and of satisfaction has only the same negative significance and the universal that thus comes in sight does not appear to consciousness as its own deed the unity of truth and of self-possession implied in the notion of this activity an unity which consciousness accordingly regards as its essence and its reality is not recognized as implied in this very notion nor is the unity recognized by consciousness as its own self-created and immediately possessed object rather does consciousness only hear spoken by the mediator's voice the still fragile assurance that its own grief is in the yet hidden truth of the matter the very reverse namely the bliss of an activity which rejoices in its task that its own miserable deeds are in the same hidden truth the perfect work and the real meaning of this assurance is that only what is done by an individual is or can be brackets uberhaupt and brackets a deed but for consciousness both activity and its own actual deeds remain miserable its satisfaction is its sorrow and the freedom from this sorrow in a positive joy it looks for in another world but this other world where its activity and its being are to become even while they remain its own real activity and being what is this world but the image of reason of the assurance of consciousness that in its individuality it is and possesses all reality end of the contrite consciousness from phenomenology of the spirit by georg wilhelm hegel published in eighteen hundred and seven freely translated from the german by josiah royce